I'm going to be leading people through an activity. Uh, as Susan says, my name is Gordon Bilbrow. I am a PhD student in the Department of Drama, and I lecture here. Also, though, led to all of those, for the last 22 years, I've run what we would call an applied theater organization that uses theater for life skills education, creating theater shows in schools. Life skills education uh, started with HIV AIDS back at the end of the 80s and has moved on to sort of broader concepts of behavior and life skills. And that's all I'm going to say about that, uh, because we're going to play the game. Uh, the point of this course, as I understood it, was to bring these sort of dis different disciplines together. In our discipline, we do, because the doing is an important part of the work. And then we reflect on that in order to understand how we felt during the doing and understand how we're making meaning in the activity. So, uh, I can't, and there's not enough time in 30 minutes to get you all into making a theatre play or a scene or anything, any of the kind of actual work that we do. But at Arab Theatre of Life, which I've worked at, we created a, we adapted a game that we found years and years ago uh, around HIV and AIDS, adapted it to try and give a similar kind of experience to how we imagine the show's work uh, around human rights. And that's what we're going to do today. So could everybody please stand up and come onto the floor? So we're going to play a game. Uh, there are three stations on the floor. Agree, disagree, and not show. All right? I'm going to read out a statement. And then what I want you to do is uh, think about the statement in terms of where you position yourself in terms of the statement. And then move to that station on the floor. Okay? The statements, there is no right or wrong place to be. It's, it's entirely about your personal, how you personally feel about that. Once everyone has moved to the station, I will then move from one station to the next and ask some of the people standing at each station to share why they are in that space. You may choose not to share why you're there, but then I'm going to ask you to please share why you feel that you don't want to share. <laughs> okay, um, there are a couple of rules though. Uh, when you are speaking, I, I will nominate the person and say, would you like to speak, the person will speak. That person speaks directly to me and to nobody else and please nobody else speaks. Even if you violently, violently disagree and feel that the world will come to a tragic and complete end, if you don't at least snort at the person's opinion, <laughs> please, that is speaking. We're going to try and keep it so that you speak directly to me. If you need to say something, put your hand up, and then I'll come to you and give you the opportunity to say what you'd like to say again to me. OK. Uh, and that's about all I'm going to say. Clear? Is everyone clear? The death penalty should be brought back. The death penalty should be brought back. Anyone? <laughs> there should be reasons for it going away. And those it were? It shouldn't be brought back? What were the good reasons for it going away? Because it was a good thing for people's uh, well-being, respect, human dignity, human rights. Okay, uh, you're, you're not giving me quite enough here, and if I try to say with what you say, I would be putting too much of my own interpretation. So could you perhaps expand just a little bit by what you mean by removing it because of people's rights and dignities was a good thing? Well, it was, re it was taken away because it was an infringement of people's rights and dignities, and it was a good thing it was uh, taken away in South Africa, and bringing it back would be a bad thing. Okay, so for you, you disagree with the statement because uh, it infringes people's rights, sure. and therefore uh, it, it was not an appropriate thing to have in, the, in this situation, and it would therefore be inappropriate to return it. Okay, does somebody have a different reason or something how they'd like to add to that? Or do you all completely power. agree? It's about power, and, and, and that's something that's open to being abused or misused. You know, who has the power to decide to take somebody else's life, and how do you manage that power battle? So, that's why I wouldn't want to. Okay, so you just put a statement. I'm going to add, because there's an inherent value to human life, 
and that you are then questioning who would have the power to take that life away and make that choice, and how would one determine that those set of decisions that would permit such a thing? Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. The justice system is is fallible. It's been shown many, many times before. So. Okay. So for you, the justice system is, is available, and again, I'm adding fallible, yeah. it, fallible. And so the option would be that how would you know that the right choice had been made, the potential for a mistake with such a dire uh, consequence uh, exists in our justice system? Can I ask a question? You may. What's the difference between murder and judicial murder? <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you, you're, you're asking a question in, in terms of actually putting the question forward as a statement. So can I ask you to rather say what prompted the question for you? Well, what I'm trying to say is that murder is inhuman and taking a person's life is inhuman. And uh, affront to their dignity, affront to their rights. But it doesn't matter which side it's on, it's still wrong. Okay, so for you, uh, going on something said before. If a man stabs a man to death. That's murder and that's bad. If somebody else tells him to take his life by technically reading the law, as they do in America, that's a terrible thing. That's taking another life. An eye for an eye, a life for a life. Okay. It doesn't sound right. So for you, uh, taking someone's life is considered murder and you don't necessarily see the distinction between judicially sanctioned murder because the act would still be the same. It would still be taking someone's life. Okay. Would you call it uh, incorrect judgments on murder cases, and so people like the justice, like like Helen said, the justice system is <laughs> severely flawed. Okay. So again, with you, the possibility is, is that uh, the system is too flawed to take to be able to make those kind of decisions with impunity or t with, that you could trust. And there's a history of incorrectness in those decisions. Sorry, and there's a history of incorrectness in our current system with those decisions. And, and it's not a deterrent. Okay, uh, for you also, uh, it wouldn't be a deterrent to something that hasn't necessarily been voiced, but the possibility, I think you're alluding to, that people often refer to it as it would be a good deterrent for crime. Okay? All right. I'm sorry, but you're the only person there. <laughs> but would you like to tell me why you agree? Uh, cool, so I've got three reasons. The first <laughs> is, because I, I should speak for all of us here. Um, <laughs> In some cases, I would argue that if there's not a, f a fallacy or mistake in the legal system, there could be potential for a moral weighting where it would be fair to take a life for a set of lives. Could we kill Hitler? I mean, he was not exactly a nice guy. Uh, the second one would be, I would agree on condition that we could have a perfectly uh, infallible system in an ideal world where we can weight these moral and ethical issues clearly and without subjective and bias and all sorts of other things that creep in. And then thirdly, and the real reason I'm here is because I believe that there should always be someone to play devil's advocate and there should always be someone to voice another concern because otherwise we're all going to be a democracy heading off in one direction when we could have missed something which potentially is wrong, potentially is right, but no one's discussing what could be on the other side of the fence. Okay. So uh, you agree with the statement for two reasons. One, uh, because you see the potential where there could, the weight of removing someone's life for, as a consequence of something you think, could possibly, there could be a circumstance it where... It could be weighted up equally without some bias or system force. Yeah, where it equals something else, yeah. that, that some other crime, there could be a reason for that. Uh, but you do uh, add that that should be within uh, an ideal system where the system is fair and where you could trust the system. Yes. And you also said that you feel that you're in a position where one should also... Uh, express a dissenting view if the majority is moving one way, just to keep, I'm adding your words here, but to keep the system yeah. honest, to keep people thinking about the other possibilities. Yeah, you should be able to entertain it without necessarily wholeheartedly believing in it to encourage discussion and make sure that at least we're having some <laughs> input from the agreed <laughs> side, even if it's a little bit uh, uh, where I, should, I don't think I really should be standing, but that's why I'm standing here. Okay. Cool. So part of it is just to ensure that the notion of healthy debate, that people are considering the other possible yeah. options. We have electricity. <laughs> okay, thank you. Somebody from North Shore. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I find a conflict between when I read about things that I think that might get the death penalty in another system, but don't necessarily hear. 
how do I balance that with the strength of knowing that I have on occasion felt I could happily kill that person? Or I may have consciously or unconsciously participated in the death of someone else. Um, or chosen that in some way in my life. And the feeling, the strength of emotion and response to that thing, that person should not exist because it makes me safer, it makes me less traumatized, it enables society to exist in a way that I believe we could exist, versus the fallibility of systems, the fact that actually I don't think that, I think that we do have the right to life and human beings, individuals are in circumstances very often where perhaps they for whatever reason feel that that is their only option um, or they aren't so pressurized that they behave from a place where maybe they wouldn't behave from if they'd had a different background or a different set of experiences to shape how they engage with the world. So it's a case of, I would, you know, some days I'd love to put someone behind bars or send them to the death chamber or whatever and then you think about the actual physical experience of that and think, no, I couldn't, I don't want to be putting someone through that. Okay. Before they might get there in another way. So, so for you, you're not sure this is because you see a, a number of different sides to the debate, which, if I'm hearing you correctly, also depends on where you cite yourself personally. So, are there sometimes when, when you're deeply personally affected by something, when you can feel in yourself a feeling that would prompt you to actually have someone removed for your safety or the safety of your family, but if you the more you distance yourself from it, the more you can see other sides to the debate, the possibility that, the, uh, that a person's rights are being infringed, the possibility that the person may not have had much of an option to, that they were forced into making those choices and that maybe there are other possibilities around rehabilitating them, I added that word. Uh, so in, in a large portion for you, it really is where you are and how you are citing yourself within the debate, but you can see all of those sides at this moment. Or, add one aspect, yes, please. Which is um, that that person would possibly would live with the consequences of that action anyway, and some people may have the experience of knowing that that was something they did that they wouldn't maybe have done in another situation. So you're adding to the also the notion that when somebody has to deal with the consequences of taking somebody else's life, the living or dealing with those consequences could be a very valuable exercise for them to do that may perhaps killing them would not necessarily afford. Yeah. Okay? Anybody else from not sure? Um, I might as well, because my feeling was the same as uh, <coughs> what he expressed, where like you, there's no f infallible way to know right now. But there might be an in, like there might be an infallible way in the future. So should implies a future. So I'm not sure. Like maybe if that came about, then it would be more appropriate to reconsider the idea. But at the moment, it's not. So that's why I'm like not sure because. Okay. So you're not sure because, uh, and I'm assuming you're talking infallible in terms of the system making mistakes. Th those yes. mistakes. But you might feel differently were you able to trust that the system was more was less likely to make mistakes sometime in the future, so yes. you're not sure. But then I would have to revise my decision again, because then different things come into play. Mm. Okay, so, so for now, you're not sure, and at the moment you would say no. Yes. Is that, is that correct? Yes. <laughs> so I'm kind of standing here, because at the moment I would be there, but then maybe in the future I would move over, but I'm not sure <coughs> what, what I would do in the future. Yeah. <laughs> So you're not sure, temporarily, you're not sure. You're <laughs> yes. <laughs> different time frames are changing. OK. Anyone else like to? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw something in. I, I don't think it's a good example to set, to kill people who have killed people, to show people that killing people is wrong. Yeah. But if that makes sense, hopefully that formulation makes sense to someone out there. But I also think that, dependent on the circumstances, uh, the context-specific environment in which we're speaking, whether it be the legislative system, whether it be the ability to rehabilitate um, someone who has committed an atrocious crime, whether it be a rape or uh, taking someone else's life. If we look at the South African circumstances, people are being uh, rehabilitated into a completely different uh, social context, into gang culture, 
and then they're being released early because the sentences have been reduced because we don't have the capacity to actually keep them in jail, and then they become repeat offenders. I don't know if there are some people that have committed horrendous crimes, is my bottom line, um, that can be rehabilitated in a positive way, back and reintegrated into society. Okay, so for you, you feel, you personally start off by saying you don't feel that killing someone because they killed somebody is actually in any way helpful to other people in terms of the learning experience. Oh no, I won't do it now because that's what's happened. So you don't see it as, a, as an appropriate punishment for, for teaching or, or for learning or that people would use as a deterrent. But at the same time, you are unaware of any, any circumstances in this country where somebody has been rehabilitated uh, and learned from them say, into a situation where they can be reintegrated to society and not be considered to be a threat or to do the crime again. Yeah, I'm, sure there are, I'm sure there are examples, obviously, of people who have spent... I know plenty of people that have spent time in prison that have served their sentence, come back, and are honest, good, non-offenders, uh, I suppose. But if someone rapes a small child, I, I can't understand with my own moral conscience how you can reintegrate that person into society. There are some crimes that do not value human life. Okay. So we have 10 minutes left. I don't even think we have 10 minutes left. Okay. Five minutes. I'm sorry, my phone completely distracted me. But So what you were saying was that um, you don't feel that... Uh, there are certain crimes that you don't that you feel are, are of such a nature that the offender you, you're not convinced that offender could be reintegrated back into society in a way that society could cope or that it would be beneficial to society okay thank you very much now this is just way too short Helen and I are going to be talking about work we've both been doing and the experience we've both had in dealing with patients who have drug resistant TB. Um, and in the Western Cape, drug resistant TB is a particularly big problem. It's a particularly common problem. Uh, and it's a particular human rights problem. Um, we were hoping that uh, Tembin Korsi Kondela would join us, but uh, he might be lost somewhere in Italy. Um and really what we want to share with you some of the conundrums and difficulties that really raise human rights issues for um, work with drug resistant TB. Um, so, because, so because I'm an academic, I have PowerPoints and I'm going to talk to them briefly, but not many of them. So uh, Sue had, uh, had asked us to talk to the question of do patients have rights? And um, South Africa has had many situations like this one. I don't know if you remember Baby Miley. It was a baby that uh, had um, gastro and was taken from one clinic to the next for um, treatment. Uh, her grandmother carried the baby on her back. She was turned away from repeated clinics and after two days the baby died as a result of dehydrating gastro. There was an inquiry uh, and this is the newspaper headline the city of Jane. And how is it possible that this could happen in a country with a constitution that guarantees the right of access to health care, guarantees many rights in our constitution. And um, this is a quote from Justice Squeeia when he was being interviewed for the Constitutional Court. And he said, well, you can have the nicest of constitutions on paper. If it doesn't relate to the reality, then there are difficulties. You can't speak, one can't speak of a person's dignity when that person is living in squalor. The person can't have access to facilities, medical facilities, and for that reason, we have socioeconomic rights in our constitution. So we have a country of, of these huge uh, contrasts. We have a fantastic constitution that the world loves, the Bill of Rights the world loves, but we have this kind of reality. So TB in the Western Cape has always been a problem, was a problem before we had the HIV epidemic. Um, the Western Cape is about 13% of the cases, and our cases have gone up about threefold uh, from 1996 to 2012. The prevalence, that means how common it is, is doubled. And uh, the mortality, death from TB, has more than doubled uh, in that period of 18 years. And there are studies in South Africa which confirm that amongst health workers, health professionals, the risks are about six times higher for contracting drug resistant TB. And, uh, the TB. and the problem is, of course, of drug resistance. And it, 
It used to be thought that drug-resistant TB was related to the problem that people get given drugs and don't take them properly. So the, the fact that they're not taking them properly helps to breed the, the resistant microbes. But in fact, we know now that people are contracting drug-resistant TB de novo. So the first infection they have is a drug-resistant variant, uh, which means they caught it from somebody else. Uh, and this is our problem. Uh, in 2012, Gina Bernard looked at um, the problem of drug-resistant TB. We have what's called multi-drug-resistant TB. That's when you're resistant to two classes of drugs. But extreme drug-resistant TB is when you're basically resistant to almost anything that you can supply. It's just kind of going up and it's going up. So we had then about 100 to 150 cases a year. And that's only the cases that we know of that come to the services. So what does it imply? If you have extreme drug resistant TB, you're taking multiple drugs. You could be taking eight drugs or more. Some of them are injectables. Not nice. It's a long treatment. Um, there are often side effects. The injectable drugs make you deaf. In about 25 to 50%, you have hearing loss. Um, and until 2011, you could only be treated in hospital. So you had to be in hospital if you had extreme drug resistant TB. Uh, and the prognosis is very poor. A recent study showed that basically by Two years, half of the patients were dead, and by five years, three quarters of the patients were dead. But notably, 11 patients were not. They were surviving. Five years, no treatment, extreme drug resistant TB. And so, what happens if you get put in hospital? Well, patients escape, and there have been a number of these very high profile events. This is Brooklyn Chest Hospital, um, which a student once called Broken Chest Hospital, and it's a good metaphor actually. And um, patients refuse to stay in hospital because it's a pretty dreary place. It's far away from your family. Uh, you're surrounded by other patients. You cut off. So the patients left. So the, ho the hospital actually went to court to try and force two patients back into hospital with extreme drug resistant TB. Uh, the court eventually ruled in its favor. One of the patients had died by that stage. Um, the other patient was told to go back but just refused. So the enforcement of the court order was a bit pointless. And um, in Gauteng, in fact, it was somewhat more high profile. The patients actually, um, there was a protest at the hospital and there was some violence and injury. So what can we do? Well, not a lot we can do to prevent TB transmission. Ventilation is supposed to be a really good thing, but if you look around this room, well, uh, you've got some air conditioning going. We had actually thought of setting up a carbon dioxide diffuser, which is the way you measure ventilation, and uh, telling you afterwards how little ventilation there is in this room. But uh, the World Health Organization talks about six air changes per hour. Uh, so you would have to have enough ventilation to move air through the room sufficient to take those microbes out. And most people live in environments or work in environments where that's not the case. And in fact, recently there was a paper published about if you get in a taxi, <laughs> and most people go to work in a taxi in the Western Cape, windows are closed, there's lots of opportunities for transmission, and they actually estimated that about three quarters of all transmission that gives rise to drug resistant TB occurs in public transport, in taxis actually mainly. Uh, it's said that if you use ultraviolet light, you can sterilize the uh, micro, but um, there's some question about how reliable it is and maintenance of the equipment. Uh, if you detect drug resistant TB early, at least you can get people out of an infectious context so they don't infect others. Uh, and then um, there's the question of masks. <laughs> so, I can see the two stalwarts sitting here, they've still got, the, and there's one there, and you just put your mask back on, but it's... Exactly, exactly. So you realize how difficult it is and you're asking patients to sit in waiting rooms or to go in public transport wearing a mask. And I think we're going to hear more about that a bit later. Yeah. So it's not an easy uh, thing to do. And what if the patient is unwilling or abusive? And we've had situations where patients have uh, been, on, been actually discharged home and there are young kids in the house or there are people who are immunocompromised and they are not willing to wear to practice safe um, hygiene. And the problem is of course what does that mean for policy? And the newspaper headlines say well government's hands are tied and the implication is because patients have rights government can't do anything to control the spread of the epidemic in communities. 
That's not true, but that's the public perception. So if, if patients are on treatment and they've been on treatment for 12 months, 15 months, some patients have been on treatment for three years on and off, and they're still infectious, well, what do you do with them? Can you keep them in hospital? We'll have to start building um, a new hospital every two years in the Western Cape, uh, the size of Kruitske Hospital, to cope with all those patients. So we have to find ways of managing them outside the hospital. Um, can you send them home? Well, you can, but then you have to worry about infection control in the home spread to other family members. So this recent study showed that in fact there was some transmission going on from patients who'd been sent home as treatment failures. Um, and uh, MSF have been trying to do work in Kailitsha particularly, trying to provide tools to community members to control infection in the home through making sure that family members will wear masks when they go into the room where the patient is, making sure kids don't go, making sure the patient has a separate bedroom. Even putting vent ventilation in, I don't know if you've seen these whirly birds, things which go around passively when the breeze blows. Well, actually those whirly birds are very effective in sucking air out of the room and changing air. So in fact, many of the city of Cape Town clinics have got um, whirly birds installed to protect uh, health workers. And that's the problem. What about transmission to health workers? So you have patients who have very, very noxious, virulent strains of drug resistant TB. What are the health workers going to do? This is a quote from the Health Systems Trust. They publish a South African health review. A health worker talking about patients. They are so rude. Sometimes they talk, you talk to them nicely. You say, Sisi, others are wearing masks. Please, you must wear masks. But they say they can't because they have rights. I usually tell them, yes, you have rights. But before you use your rights, you must know others have rights too. So we have this situation where rights are really being, you know, there's whose rights, how do you balance those rights? And they're being opposed against each other. So in fact, there have been articles saying, well, XDR TB in South Africa, we're going back to the days of the sanatorium, I'm afraid. Um, and here's a vignette. So th these are all cases that uh, I've come across. Community psychologist is asked to counsel the patient who has drug extreme drug resistant TB. The psychologist is in a room about, about the size of from here. So it's a tiny room. No windows, no ventilation. Psychologist phones, her supervisor says, <laughs> can, can I refuse? What can I do? Uh, she tells the manager that, you know, that it's an infection risk. The manager says, well, wear a mask. So you're a psychologist, you have to counsel the patient while you're wearing a mask. Can you counsel the patient? No. So uh, does the psychologist refuse? Can she refuse? What do you think? Yeah. So uh, actually in terms of occupational health legislation, she could refuse and she should refuse and that's what we advised her to do. Um, a patient with drug resistant TB has absconded treatment for the fourth time, he's been on and off treatment, uh, he remains infectious, the clinic says okay well this is it, we can't carry on treating him on, on and off because we're simply multiplying, amplifying the resistance, no more treatment, we'll, we'll give him pain treatment, we'll give him support but no TB drugs comes back to the clinic, he says, I want TB drugs. The staff say, well, sorry, you're a treatment failure, we can't treat you. And then um, the patient threatens to spit in the face of the health worker. What does the health worker do? So these are cases which come, there's a, a drug resistant TB panel that deals with so-called difficult cases. Uh, a young Somali refugee was here, been on treatment for um, ordinary TB, it developed into multi-drug resistant TB. Um, Part of the treatment of multi-drug resistant TB is an injectable, and the injectable makes you deaf uh, and gives you side effects, so he stopped taking his treatment regularly. The, the TB evolved into extreme drug resistant TB. He was a treatment failure. He was extremely depressed. Is he a treatment failure because of his uh, poor adherence, or is he a treatment failure because the health system failed him? So. This idea that we can bring back sanatoria, put these X, XDR patients in a sanatorium, well, you know, a lot of people are talking about it, but it's not really practical. And what about rights? So, whose rights really matter in this situation? You have the patient's rights, the family members, the health workers, the uninfected community, but many of them are actually already infected, they don't know it. So there are many, many things at stake here. And how do we balance rights fairly? So it's very interesting, there was a working group in New York that um, people quote a lot. 
where they, they threaten to put TB, XDR, TB, uh, XDR patients in jail if they had XDR and they weren't taking following precautions. So that evidence has been used to support claims to be more um, authoritarian about handling XDR patients. But the, the group themselves make this point that it's actually the credible threat that is really the issue. So it's not actually using the, th the, the jailing option, it's actually having the credible threat of jail as a last resort. And as they say, you have to make concerted em efforts to address all the systemic issues in the health system that have given rise to drug-resistant TB in the first place. And we've done some analyses suggesting how it's possible to do that, and I think the work of MSF, and maybe what Helen and students are going to talk about, will help illustrate some of the alternatives to the sort of authoritarian option. So that's what I wanted to say. And I think if you want to take off your mask, you could do that. <laughs> and we'll talk about it at the end, actually. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Leslie came to us um, and the question he was asking of the anthropologists was we just don't know what people are doing. Um, and Leslie sits on a board with MSF who are rolling out a decentralised program in Kaya and they were feeling at sea around behaviour. And of course that's what the anthropologists in a sense do best. We do kind of like human behaviour. Now that led to Kate who's sitting here doing a master's thesis and there were a couple of honours students and from then it's grown and grown. Karina last year did her honours thesis and some of the images that I'm going to show come from the work that they've done. Now some of them are just pure visuals of the area that they worked in but what I really like about some of the visuals is it's their methods that they use. They used very visual methods. And I think we can even possibly have some conversations about, you know, drawing on alternative methods. I mean, what Gordon gave us earlier was really exciting as alternative ways of thinking about how we do research to try and get to some of the really tough answers. Um, so what's going to scroll through in the background is just a whole variety of different images that I've sort of taken from my students work. When I looked at the outline that Susan put together for this course, she wanted some kind of comparative with um, India and my research has been done in India. And when we're talking about human rights, one of the human rights issues that are coming up in India is the call by some medical experts that they actually disband the DOTS program. Their argument being that no program is better than a really badly run program. Does anyone have any idea what could be behind, be behind that type of call? No program is better than a badly run program. Yes? Yeah, essentially the argument that's been made is that the treatment is keeping more infectious people alive, a greater number of people alive while they're in an infectious stage, uh, which is leading to a, a greater spread. So the cure rates aren't necessarily going up, but the infection rates are. Now, that's not a debate for me as an anthropologist to sort of take up, but when we're talking about the comparative context in which say human rights come out in local context. So here in South Africa, it's very much about individual versus sort of collective rights, the public good. Do we actually put people into centralized, say hospital setting? Um, whereas in, in India, it's not even an option. People don't go to local hospitals. You are freely out among the population. Um, and one of the things that they are really arguing back against is in India you have a, what would they call it, a thrice weekly dose, whereas here it's a daily treatment. And the argument in India is you only need it once every three days, so why don't we just give it to, one, to them once every three days and therefore the adherence will go up. That's not what's translating into people's behaviour. They might only be taking it once a week. So there's a lot of problems with the Indian model and I worked with a non-profit organisation of medical doctors who were rolling out 
a, their own TB treatment, which is something that couldn't happen in South Africa. You couldn't have a bunch of doctors just go ahead and say, we don't like the DOTS program, so we're going to do our own thing. But in India, you can pretty much do what you want, when you want, how you want. So these doctors have set up the most extraordinary treatment program, and most of the patients that they're receiving are what we would call treatment failures. And they're coming to this particular clinic, this is it right here, um, run by a group of doctors who should have probably had lucrative careers in Delhi, have given it all up, taken their families to very rural Chhattisgarh to try and work around um, public health rights. And it's been fascinating. This is their laboratory on site. And as you'll see, it will roll over. They actually test, they're developing their own methods of testing they are able to turn around a TB diagnosis in 15 minutes, which is just extraordinary. You can arrive in the morning, talk to your doctor. He will say, I think you've got TB. We need to go and test. Go down a few rooms down, produce some sputum. They are testing it in 15 minutes. You come back for counseling. This is um, Rajiv who does all the counseling and you are counseled every, you're given a month's worth of treatment. You come back on a monthly basis, you get counselling every single time you come back. Um, the other thing they do is they adjust um, treatment for your body weight and the amount of food that you're actually able to intake. So this particular group of doctors is a, have actually got a very individualised programme. I looked at this sort of matrix or algorithm, it's this huge big page broken down by gender, broken down by body weight, broken down by food and income to say this is the dosage that we're giving you and as you increase your body weight we can increase the dosage that we give you to keep the side effects to a minimum. Um, so I think what they're doing is absolutely extraordinary but the idea of possible, well India's got a far greater population than South Africa and their system is I would be inclined to say as haphazard as ours Possibly they have better resources, but I'm not sure about that. But what I want to talk about is actually my students' work, because they've done some extraordinary work. And to talk about the South African context around human rights here, when we talk about individual versus possibly collective rights, Laura Winterton, who I was hoping was going to be here, did her honours and her master's thesis. Yes, that's Kate, <laughs> who I'm going to call up here to talk about the mask in a minute. Um, she looked at, in her honours thesis, what it took for successful treatment, what it took for a person to be adherent, what constituted a successful patient, a responsible person who is willing to take on their own health care. Now I do have a full set of notes that I was going to give to Simon to load up for you, so please don't get too concerned about what I'm saying. And what she showed was that people who are hospitalized for six months in the initial part of their treatment and then released into a decentralized program, the way they talked about their experience was about gaining capabilities. As much as they didn't particularly like the confinement that came with being in, say, a hospital setting, they saw it as a place where they got resources, they got education, they got knowledge about their illness. They were able to talk to other patients and gain moral support. Now admittedly, they might talk also about bitchy, revolting staff, or the side effects, and a lot of negative, um, the food, food's always bad in any hospital. Um, so all of these things also um, played out in particular ways. Equally, she went into what constitutes a defaulting patient and looked at the fact that when we talk about human rights, it places a massive burden on the community. The community ends up carrying the burden of care. So she's also interested in, well, what happens when the burden of care falls on the community? Do they have the capabilities? to actually do this. And what patients were saying to her is, it can vary from day to day. It can vary from week to week. If I lose my job, or a family member loses their job in one week, I no longer have the capability to be within the home environment. That's when I'd like to be able to return to the hospital. So in fact, what she was uncovering in her research is that people almost wanted to be able to move in and out of systems. 
according to what they were capable of doing. The side effects were so bad in certain cases that people couldn't physically walk to the clinics. The injections are exceedingly painful. Bodies literally become almost crippled with the in, um, injectable um, medications, where people have to be helped with walking. Um, so I want to just pose Laura's research in that way. Another piece of research, which was done by Ziyanda, who the anthropology students will know, was she was looking at young mothers who had been diagnosed with TB and what that meant in terms of mothering. What's the burden of mothering as well as the burden of trying to cure oneself? And again, it poses a really interesting, I'm hoping I'm gonna convince her to be able to write an article for World TB Day, which is coming up. But what she talked about was the unburdening that could happen with the disability grant. The disability grant that the government gives out for TB enabled mothers to feel financially secure about their children. So it unburdened them in particular ways. What also happened was the protection of the child. So she had a very small sample group. It would be useful to find out if this is a widespread phenomenon. So I don't want to say this is generalizable at all. She had a very small sample set. But of these young mothers, they were either removed from their children or their children were removed from them in terms of community support. So in one case, the child was being raised by the father and the father's family. And the mother moved into her aunt's house. What we see then is the burden being placed on other families for the site of care, in a sense. So one of the things that comes up very strongly across the different research that my students have done is that people have very, very clear notions of what they consider to be a site of cure and a site of care, and how these can intersect or play out in quite negative ways. So all you need is a nurse deciding that she's got the hump with you one day, putting you to the back of the queue, and you might actually have someone saying that they don't want to go back to that care facility because the nurses are revolting. You talk to the nurses and the nurses are saying, well, you've got to be tough with some of these patients. If you don't tell them that they take their treatment and you know, they'll say things like, do you want to die? Now that can be interpreted as a motivating statement. Do you want to die? Or it can be interpreted for some as a very demotivating. So for some, the clinic and the staff are very much a site of care and cure. For others, it's a site of just you know, negligence, and they don't want to return to these particular places. Um, I'm trying to think of what other research. I want to actually ask Kate if she will spare us five minutes to talk about her research to do with the masks, because you all had an embodied reaction to it. Within 30 seconds, I've seen them around their neck, draped on their head like a pair of sunglasses, hanging off ears. Most of them were not put on correctly, but that's not your fault. Um, I was wondering if you want to... Um, yeah, so a lot of you failed. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. Um, so the, some of the, the photos that you've seen up here were taken from my master's research. Um, I just finished my PhD, well, I submitted my PhD um, at Brooklyn, or Broken Chest Hospital, um, working with pediatric patients. But most of my experience uh, during my master's was working with adult TB patients. And so one of the things that I was really interested in were masks. Um, can I just ask you, what were some of your first initial reactions to the mask? Some of you did put them on right, you know, in the correct manner. I'm not going to name names. But what, what were your initial reactions? Oh, no, no, no. Okay, why was it horrible to wear? It's just always just it smells and gets your hot, moldy, humid feeling. It's very uncomfortable to think. Sweaty, yes. What else? I just find them so hard to kind of communicate with people or talk to people because you can't see people's mouths. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, when you use it, it's so hard to communicate with people because you want to comfort them or you want to talk to them, but you can only see your eyes. So with your eyes, you have to just tell them. You have to say so many more things with your eyes and it's just so hard to communicate properly with people. Yeah. And it's just these eyes peering out and everyone's eyes looking anxious and it's just exactly. so... Strange. So there's, there are some very visual uh, factors at play when you're talking about wearing an N95 respirator mask. Um, in the clinics I worked in, uh, you have these sort of pithy, gauzy um, 
completely ineffectual clinical masks, yeah, um, which don't really do anything, to be honest, um, because the, in the clinics I worked in, they were much more rudimentary than those. Um, but the minute you walk into a, a clinical space, especially if you're meeting a support group or you're a patient or you're going in for uh, you know, a medication pickup, uh, you'd have these gauzy masks and then you'd have the uh, MDR and XDR TB patients um, who would have these very different masks. So it immediately creates a, a signifier of a different, a, a different magnitude of illness. You have a different mask, it marks you, it's a stigmatizing um, uh, signifier. Um, and they're obviously big and they're bulky and um, that is usually reserved for a surgeon. Uh, Somebody who's... Splash with, splash <laughs> protector. Um, so many of the people that I worked with hated the masks. And I mean, you can understand if you are sitting and waiting in the queue and people are looking at you, you feel as though you're being stigmatized, whether you are or not, um, it, it doesn't actually matter because that stigma is real to the person that is experiencing it. And um, one of my interests was TB related stigma. And so I decided that yes, um, outside of my comfort zone, which was clinical spaces, people's homes, my own car, where I had to wear the mask, that I would cruise around in taxis going to and from Kailicha. Because in 2000, and it was either 2009, 2010, the WHO Stop TB Partnership decided to target these individual taxis. Um, and they had these little signs that said, Vula i Festile, Stop TB. So in Kosa, translated English, open the window, Stop TB to obviously help uh, facilitate ventilation. Well, stickers don't open windows and uh, people associate outside air with, well, TB transmission or potential contagion, coming into contact with dirty air, right? So won't go into all those etiologies, but uh, it was one of the most, I think, harrowing experiences to try to put myself in the position of someone um, wearing this mask, because it does, it obscures your face, you have no facial recognition. It's hard to tell if you're smiling or if you're frowning or what's going on. People can't understand you and people are visibly horrified by you. And so it really gives us pause to reconsider the types of um, public health efforts, intervention strategies that are handed down from uh, various NGOs, NPOs, the government health sector itself, because it may be really good policy on paper as uh, Leslie was speaking to earlier, but it doesn't mirror the realities on the ground. It doesn't take into account uh, stigma that someone may feel they will encounter in their day-to-day -day life. And so what do you have? You have a situation where you have these really fancy masks that are really terrifying to those that wear them, but also to those that perceive them because it's an unknown. Is this person sick? What are they doing? You know, It creates this big unknown, ambiguous, gray blob of misunderstanding, miscomprehension. Um, so that was, I think that's the time yeah. that I got. Should I think we that wrap that up from us?